We're going to kind of do something a little different. We don't usually do this on Sunday morning on our video, but I want us to sing, To God Be the Glory. <laughs> song is it not a great old hymn I want to invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Hebrews to the book of Hebrews and we want to uh, look at some things today with regard to the Lord's Supper uh, we want to uh, start draw your attention rather to Hebrews chapter number four and I want us to look at verses 14 uh, through 16 together, if we may. Could we do that? Uh, in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 14, it talks this way. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not and high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If I wanted to talk about this, if I were to address this message or give it a title, I would call it the emotions of Jesus specifically pertaining to the Lord's Supper. Jesus is displayed here in this passage of Scripture as our great high priest. He is a great high priest who is leading the way to us, for us, and that he has ascended into heaven as someday we as his children will do as well. We will either ascend by virtue of the call from heaven or we will ascend through death's door. But the truth of the matter is every believer, every person who knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior will end up in the same place, dwelling in the same place as Jesus dwells. That's the object of our redemption. That's the object of our salvation, that we might dwell with Jesus eternally in the celestial city that he has prepared for me and you. That's the goal. He has done all of this throughout the whole content of the Bible, from the book of Genesis to the book of the Revelation. All of that Jesus is doing, uh, is showing us 
what it's going to be like and how we arrive at the final destination that we are all headed for. So we are headed for a final destination. He has told us then that we can hold fast to our profession. We don't need to be afraid of death. Certainly, it can be a consternation in the part of the spirit of a human being when they learn that their time on earth is shortened through some disease or illness or whatever. But listen, we need not fear death. The Bible tells us this very plainly. Paul says it. To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. So we don't fear death. We don't fear its call upon us. We don't fear any of those things because we know the minute we pass through that porthole called death, we shall remain with the Lord. We shall be with the Lord and we shall forever be with the Lord. So we hold fast to that hope and that profession. Now, Jesus, it says here in verse 15, cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now here's an issue, okay? And I'm going to touch on these things lightly because i got a whole bunch more I want to say. But the fact of the matter is, we overemphasize the human nature of God. In particular, the human nature of Jesus. Yes, Jesus was the God-man. Yes, Jesus came. He came in flesh and bone and blood to give his life as a ransom for many, uh, as we are that part of that group. But the fact of the matter is, there was a great difference between what we go through and what Jesus went through. While Jesus was God, the God-man, Jesus did not have the same kind of temptation that you and I might go through because it says here very plainly, yet he was without sin. Jesus did not have the sin nature. Sin did not abide in Jesus. There was no such thing as sin in Jesus. But for you and me, that is not true. We have the sin nature. And having the sin nature... We have the same infirmity that Jesus experienced except for one thing. He never had a sin in his life. Do you remember the Bible that says that we are to be angry and sin not? And so emotions then are a part of our living with the Lord Jesus Christ. Our emotions often guide what we do. Jesus, though, while he was sinless, did have the emotions that you and I go through. So Jesus was emotionally equipped to see those pains and to have the suffering and have the same emotions that you and I have. I just read recently a book by B.B. Warfare called The Emotions of Jesus. It's a short book for me. But it was very good and it's very helpful. Now, since this is true, we can come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain, notice, mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Well, we need both of those things, don't we? Where do we get them from? Well, we get them from Jesus, our high priest. Is it not that way? It doesn't the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, does he not give us his mercy and his grace? in our daily walk with him. Yes, we have infirmities. Yes, we sin. He didn't ever sin. So therefore, he could take the place to ex exercise mercy and grace toward us like no other. So when you think about the Lord's Supper and you think about the things that are going on in that last supper, as we call it, so much of the time, I think, we have a stilted view of what that really was like, particularly for Jesus. There were a lot of things going on there that you and I more or less brush over. And the Lord's Supper, by the way, is an ordinance and not a sacrament. You don't become the child of God by doing the Lord's Supper. 
you become a child of God by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and surrendering in him and having his blood applied to your heart and your life. That's how you become a believer. The ordinance of the Lord's Supper, however, is there to help us remember what it is that Jesus did for us in his mercy and grace for us. We didn't deserve it. We don't deserve salvation. We, deserve the good, the, we don't deserve the goodness of God. We deserve judgment. And sometimes we get this idea so much, and particularly in this coming season we're having it, that God is love. Well, yes, God is love. But God is also a God of justice, and God is also a God of, just, of judgment. Yes, there are many attributes to the God that we love and serve and that we walk after. That one of those things is in the emotional equipment that we have, and that emotional equipment was also in Jesus as well. I want to call your attention, if I may, to the book of Luke. The book of Luke in chapter number 14. If you have your Bible, you might want to open there. In Luke chapter number 14. That's in the New Testament. Luke is the third uh, book in the Gospels. And in verse number, uh, in chapter number 22, in verse number 14 through 20, we read this. It says in verse 14, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. I want you to notice here, please, that Jesus used the word desire. I desire, I desire. What does that mean? Well, desire is an emotion. So Jesus had an emotion that was going on in this Lord's Supper. And so much of the time, we look at that as a bland event. It was supercharged for Jesus. It was a supercharged event for Jesus. His emotions were there. And he called it suffering. What were those emotions? Well, one was, of course, anger. Then it was agitation. And then there was perplexity. And you say, how do you get all of that from there? Well, let me, let me just bring it to you this way. When Jesus is there sitting down eating with his apostles, was there an enemy in that group? You know there was. Judas Iscariot was there, right? And it's pointed out that Judas Iscariot was an enemy. This is a man who had walked and traveled with Jesus for over three years, had the same opportunity to salvation that the rest of them had, and had passed, and not only that, was the thief that was among them. Jesus knew his heart. Jesus knew what Judas was about to do. Jesus knew he was about to be betrayed by Judas who was sitting there at the supper with him. I don't know about you, but I know that whenever I have that kind of a betrayal going on by somebody that I uh, value, someone that has been close to me, and I find out about that, I want to tell you, doesn't it make you angry? <laughs> Do you not become agitated at that kind of a condition? Do you not wonder what's going on there? Why would this person do this to me? This is a person who has seen my lordship. This is a person who has seen my glory. This is the person who's been present. And now, he's about to turn me over to those who want to kill me. And he's doing this. Jesus wasn't this wasn't something Jesus didn't know. He knew it. He was doing it for 30 pieces of silver. 
I don't know about you, but betrayal is a hard thing to take. And yet Jesus is sitting down with these apostles as a high priest, seeking to minister to them and giving Judas one last chance to repent. And Jesus, Judas, Judas did not choose that. There's also this idea that whenever the supper is completed and you look at all that's said in the book of John about that supper and all that's going on there and Paul later addresses it in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when you see all that that's going on there, you have to understand that there's a great deal of unpleasant things that Jesus is fully aware of that are about to come his way. There's going to be the trial. There's going to be the questioning. There's going to be the cross. There's going to be Gethsemane. There's going to be a lot of things going on in the life of Jesus that are emotionally charged. And yet Jesus, unlike the human sinful nature that you and I have, did not respond to any of that in kind. He bore it all for you and me. Our sins laid on him. The agony that he would suffer those things. He says, I desire, but I'm not going to take of this vine, I'm not going to take of this meal again until we do it together in heaven. Jesus set it out forthright. This is an important issue and it's an important event and I want it in my church and I want it in the church that I built because it's an important event and it's such an important event I'm going to abstain from doing anything even like it, remotely like it until everybody's home again until everybody can sit down at the table of God. I know there's coming a day when there is going to be a feast in heaven, amen? And we're going to eat at the table of God. But listen, that table is going to be a time of celebration, a time when Jesus will sit down with his people and his people with him in the glory that he has equipped them with. Notice what he says in verse number 18, that he says, I, I will... Say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Right? But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. So there again, Jesus points out. But he says, I'm not going to partake of this. But he goes through. By the way, Judas doesn't get to stay through the whole supper. Don't miss that point, okay? Even though Jesus had an open session there with the disciples and all the disciples were free. But because of the stubbornness of Judas' heart and the rebellion in Jesus' heart and the thing that Judas was doing, he left the supper and did not partake. Well, if you look in the book of 1 Corinthians, it talks about that. It talks, he that takes of the uh, Lord's Supper unworthily drinks the damnation unto himself. And so Judas did that. And so we see there that Jesus is doing this for his people. He's suffering. There's perplexity. There's anger. There is a wild range of emotions that is filling his person at that time. I saw something uh, in a book that I read recently that stuck with me in a profound way. And I'd like to read that to you right now. And it talks about what, uh, about the suffering that Jesus was going through. It says, in the presence of his 
mental, this mental anguish, the physical tortures of the crucifixion retire into the background and we may well believe that our Lord, though he died on the cross, that's important, though he died on the cross, and this is what got me, yet died not of the cross. Yes, he was on the cross. Yes, he died on the cross. But the cross didn't kill him. What did then? But, as we commonly say, of a broken heart. That is to say, of the strain of his mental suffering. If you remember at the crucifixion, when the soldiers put the spear into the Lord's side, forthwith came blood and water. Jesus died of a broken heart there on the cross because of the rebellion of man, because of the sin of man, because of the unrepentant heart of man, because of the transfer of our sin to him, and more importantly, our willingness to give him over into the hands of the enemy. There's a lot of things going on here, isn't there? Well, in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, you're going to have to go over a book. In the book of Matthew, chapter number 26, actually two books, I want to point out again, and I'm using these evangelists here to talk about these apostles who wrote down the things about this Last Supper so that we can get a clear picture of what it is that God is saying to us in that Last Supper. In Matthew chapter number 26 and verse 26, it says this. Then release he, I'm on chapter 27, excuse me, let me go back. I started to say that ain't what I studied. I want verse 26 of 26. Let's see. Uh, you think as much as I spend in this Bible, the pages wouldn't stick together, but they do. In verse number 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of this vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung of him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Any ever, ever drink a cup of coffee and at the end you feel this grit in your mouth? Have you ever gotten any coffee grinds in your, in your coffee? Isn't that a nasty thing? When he's talking about the dregs here, he's talking about what our high priest did for us. Our high priest was like no other high priest. Our high priest was above all other high priests and that he was willing to drink the cup to the end. He told these disciples, you drink all of it. What is he saying? Jesus is going to drink all of it. Jesus is going to drink the awful dregs of our sin to the last drop. Our sin, our rebellion, our willingness to live apart from him, our unloving spirit toward him, and yet, while he was there on the cross, Jesus drank the full cup of your sin and of my sin, and he drank every bit of it. And that is the point on the cross where Jesus cried out, my God, my God, 
Can you get this? My God, my God. Broken. Why hast thou forsaken me? Well, the answer is very plain. God the Father forsook his son, not because of his sin, but because of yours and mine. We have a bad attitude about sin. <laughs> I've heard people laugh and say, well, it was just a little white lie, just a little lie. And I can justify that little lie because the end result justifies what I've done. No! All sin is a sin against God. All lies are black. All lies are sinful. I don't care what your result may be. The result, the Bible is very plain in Romans in stating this. The result of sin is death. Right? Would you all willingly acknowledge that there's death in the world today? You know why? Because men are sinners. We need forgiveness. And I, for one, am tired of the religious community and of these people who are trying to whitewash sin to make it less than what it is. Listen, sin is an offense against mighty God, Almighty God. Sin is offense, an offense against the holiness of God. Sin robs, sin depletes, sin kills. It killed Jesus. It wasn't the cross that killed Jesus. It was a broken heart that mankind would remain unrepentant to their sin. Listen, the wages of sin is still death. But the gift of God is eternal life. When, G, when he told these disciples to drink these, to drink it to the last drag, to take it all in, he was displaying to them that's exactly what he was about to do. Jesus knew about that. He was in the Garden of Gethsemane. You remember that? And he was sweating there and so intense in prayer that he sweat as it were great drops of blood with the perplexity of his soul and of his spirit, knowing what was about to transfer in his life. Jesus never dreaded death. He came for that reason. What was the dread in Jesus' heart and soul that was so debilitating to him, so debilitating, the Bible says that God sent angels there to minister to him. It, the devil would have killed him in the garden. What was it? What was that deal? That deal was, my friend, the dregs of our sin. Every last ounce of it was going to be laid on him. And Jesus knew it. And Jesus knew what that result would be, separation from his father. A separation that he never had before. Listen, Jesus was loaded with emotion. But you know what he did? He set all that emotion aside for me and you. And he offered us grace and forgiveness. Wow. No wonder we sang to him while ago at the front of this message that I'm giving. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son. You look at the words of that song, they're very appropriate for what is going on here in the life of Jesus. We need, listen, we need to glorify Jesus. We need to believe Jesus. We need to renounce our sin. We need to, we need to see our sins as we really are. They're not white, they're black. They're not harmless, they're killing us. And until man comes to full report of the sin that's in him, he will never be able to glorify God who gave his life for him. That's hard words, I know. But we have got to stop whitewashing sin. Sin caused a great deal of grief and emotional strain and pressure on my Savior who died for me. How can I ignore such a thing as that. 
Well, let's look at Mark. This is the last evangelist we want to look at. In Mark chapter number 14, hopefully my pages won't stick together again because I had it open to there this morning. In Mark chapter number 14 and verse 22, I want to read this passage as Mark recorded it. Isn't it interesting how that in every recorded instance of Jesus' suffering there before the cross and giving his lifeblood, that each one of these disciples, evangelists, take a different aspect of what was going on in the heart and mind of Jesus. In verse 22 of Mark chapter 14, and it said, they did eat. Jesus took bread and blessed to break it and gave it to them and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they drank all. They drank all, drank of it. And he said unto them, this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they sang, had sung and him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said in verse 27, Jesus said unto them, and ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. It breaks my heart. Are the sheep scattered? Listen, Jesus was a loving father, a great high priest, sitting down with his disciples for the last time to eat and to reveal to them what all was about to happen. And even those dedicated men who loved Jesus would run and hide for their lives. All of them. One would betray, the others would run. And Jesus would be left alone to face his accusers in that moment. I want to ask you something. Are you running from God? Are you the scattered sheep? Have you refused to repent and believe God? Where are you with all of this? William Booth, a Puritan writer at the time that C.S. Spurgeon was with us, which would have been the 1860s. I want to give you this word. When asked by an American newspaper what it regarded as the chief dangers ahead for the 20th century, he replied tersely, religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without uh, repentance, Salvation without regeneration and politics without God and heaven without hell. I don't know about you, but that hit me right between the eyes. Is that what we have going on right now? Is that it? All you got to do now is say, I'm a Christian, and then you can go out and live for the devil and live like all hell all week. No. No, no, a thousand times no. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in repentance and faith, he changes your heart. You are regenerated into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are made new in his likeness. 
You may still sin, but you won't enjoy it. You may still sin, but you won't live there. Listen, my friend, if you can sin before God and that sin does not break your heart like it broke Jesus' heart through the power of the Holy Spirit, you aren't his. His spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are his. Unfortunately, I believe William Booth hit it right on the nail head. God help us. Is all I can say. We need the great high priest. We need the grace and the mercy of God because we are unconditionally violating the laws and the rights of God sometimes without even the least bit of conscience about it. We have to come to the place of an expectation of righteousness that is godly. Does God expect his children to live righteous? Huh? Does he? Does he? Read the book. See what happened to the children of God when they chose to not live righteous. It's all in here. God's mandate has not changed. We are to be righteous before him. So as we think about the Lord's Supper then, and we think about everything that we've been talking about, we don't approach the Lord's Supper in a spiritual arrogance. That is not the way it comes, but in a spirit of relief. Thank God I'm the child of God. Amen? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined air with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it means to us. And God, help us to see the Lord's Supper in a different way. God, help us to recognize what you gave up for us that we might have your mercy bestowed upon us and your grace in us. God, thank you for loving us enough to go through all of those emotional turmoils that you faced in your life. And turning your back on all that emotion Instead, taking a godly approach to it all. We cannot praise you enough. We cannot lift you up enough for all that you've done for us. God, help us to walk in your ways. We pray these things in your name. Amen.